without feeling the weight of ghosts the dead ones and the ones that walk with us yet no place i know is more scornful of the past less loyal and sentimental it's all swift vicious movement march or die commerce and art and here's the funny part the ghosts wouldn't have it any other way it's in the dna of this love-hate relationship to live here you are required to attend your own funeral repeatedly these pieces were written over a period of 20 years and much has changed during that time in this march or die town and its environs rather than update them i prefer to let the older ones stand as time capsules the maharaja essay for example takes place largely at the trump taj mahal in atlantic city between 1999 and 2000 long before the casino failed and its owner graduated from local embarrassment to global nightmare. <laughs> As I gradually became aware that the stories and essays were taking on a narrative arc of their own, I started writing new ones to fill in the gaps. Half the pieces here were written for that purpose and are appearing for the first time. It's not all about the ghosts, I tell myself sometimes. A few of these essays are fairly lighthearted, and after all, my more recent writing is increasingly personal. Then I remember the underrated gambling movie Rounders and its protagonist, Matt Damon's Mike McDermott. Early on, he says, listen, here's the thing. If you can't spot the sucker in your first half hour at the table, then you are the sucker. <laughs> it occurs to me now that if you're a guy who tells ghost stories and you can't identify the ghost on your first pass, then you are the ghost. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> story called Rubber Gun. I don't know, anybody here know what a rubber gun is? What somebody's rubber gun? No. No. Okay. Are you going to tell us? One, one gun? Are you going to tell us? Um, yeah. There's something that in the police department they call the rubber gun squad. It's when someone has had their guns taken away. Usually because they have drinking problems, drug problems, um, they're involved in something with a domestic dispute. There's a reason that they should not be walking around armed. When people have their guns taken away in the police department, they're put on uh, back office duty. And they wind up doing sort of menial jobs like distributing ammunition at the uh, range out of Rodman's Neck in the Bronx and jobs like that. And it's kind of looked down on and it's a very depressing way for a cop to wind up. So I wrote about it. <laughs> <laughs> the studio has, had always felt tight and dark when I'd lived there, claustrophobic sort of small that makes a pristine room look like a mess when you toss your keys on the narrow kitchen counter. But the girls who lived there now, though there were two of them plus cats, had somehow arranged their possessions in a way that made the tiny space inviting. I scanned the room slowly but could not account for any one grand gesture that moved the apartment in that direction. Such things would always be a mystery to me. Like speaking French, reading music, or understanding the internal combustion engine, it was on some level an act of faith. I didn't know how anyone could do it, but I knew they could, and I could not. <laughs> I didn't spend a lot of time agonizing about it. There was much to be done. I needed to feed the cats, of course, but also ransack the medicine cabinet, the Vicodin and Percocet, and set up the police call scanner to listen to the neighbor's telephone conversations. And if possible, I wanted to be back home by 10 o'clock because I hadn't been sleeping well lately. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie had reiterated her old warning that I might not see the cats at all. It was possible that I'd only know their presence by the regularity of the food disappearing and the commensurate accrual of shit in the litter box. <laughs> but as usual, the first night when I arrived, they were sitting on the floor just inside the door, staring at me as I'd entered as though they anticipated the moment. The male, an elderly Siamese, was standoffish but unafraid, and the kitten, a great tabby girl, was positively insistent in her affection. I wondered why Leslie always assumed that they would hide from me. It was either their nature, and I was somehow special, or more likely just another instance of Leslie inventing a reality and then making everyone around her live in it. It was this gift of hers, I felt, that allowed her to book a cruise to Alaska for herself and June, her terminally ill girlfriend, when either of them were employed, and they had already been forced to sell their one-bedroom co-op and move into my old studio rental. I didn't miss the building much, though it still felt more like home than my new place around the corner. The new apartment was larger and brighter, and the level of cleanliness was about the same. 
There was a different super, but as with the rest of Bayridge's superintendents, he was Albanian, spoke 20 words of English, kept to himself, and from the way he managed to make the most normal activities appear furtive, was probably undocumented. <laughs> I unpacked the scanner and set it up on a bar stool in the same spot where, it, where I ultimately placed it when I lived there. I had been out of work with a line of duty injury for six months now, and it was my sergeant who first suggested the scanner when I complained of boredom after two weeks. I initially resisted because I associated scanners with EMTs, volunteers, and other buffs. I know, he told me. I thought the same thing, but it helped a lot when I was out. I mean, you're just going to get local shit, the precinct you live in. I'm out in Great Hills, fucking Hooterville. But still, you feel a little connected, and you'll be surprised by some of the weird shit in your own backyard. Another week of Maury Povich and Grand Theft Auto, and I succumbed. At first, I only turned it on in the afternoons, and it was, in fact, oddly comforting. Bay Ridge wasn't as quiet as Great Hills, but it was a world away from the 75th Precinct in East New York, where I'd worked for almost the entire eight years I'd been a cop. East New York, just about the ass end of Brooklyn, seemed to be, along with Brownsville, the only part of the borough to, es to escape the tsunami of gentrification that had so jarringly altered every other neighborhood. It remained defiantly low rent and high crime. It was a busy precinct, and I liked it. You know, I'm going to stop there with this because I read the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for holding it. Yeah, well, I'm glad. <laughs> I wanted to hear the rest of it, but my shoulder was... was <laughs> <bad. laughs> you got to go into training for these readings. I, I mean, look, that was the best shoulder workout I've gotten in months. But, um, You're welcome. So... So, so Tim, as I, I, you know, we've spoken about this before, but I love this book, and um, uh, and go, particularly the introduction, ghost stories, because as, as um, you guys may not know, but I'm half ghost on my father's side. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what like, I would like to hear a little bit more of your thoughts about what you like, what it means to be a ghost in New York City, who the ghosts are, and like what what that means for a city like New York that is always changing and always turning over. Well, as, as I said, I think I separated from nostalgia. Nostalgia is people who reminisce about the way things used to be. The ghosts, to me, are the people who still live in this town as though nothing has changed. And I am always astonished. I'm sure every major city has such an enclave and a population. But I am always astounded at the communities that I stumbled across in New York City and in Brooklyn. And that, to me, are the ghost stories. They're people who are in their 70s or 80s and are still members of their local church choir and are moving through neighborhoods that are either gentrified or dangerous. Pick one. Um, because that's what New York City is now divided into, gentrified and dangerous. And, but they live as though it were 1955. And they move through a community where they barely interact with the modern day. And th those are the people that fascinate me. And they fascinate me when they're my age or older, and they really fascinate me if they're the generation younger than us. And that has occurred. There was uh, a, a guy I worked with and worked in the courthouse with, and some of the people who were here who worked with me will know him. He was a messenger, and he sounded like Leo Gorsi, you know, in the Bowery Boys, and he was born on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and he was living in the same apartment he was born in, and he was about, when I knew him, when he retired, he was 65 years old, he was living in six large rooms on the Upper East Side, probably paying about $400 a month rent. And his routine was still, he did not have um, cable television or a cell phone. He didn't have a checking account. <laughs> so on payday, he would take his paper paycheck, bring it to the check cashing place, get cash, and then go to the bar and pay off his bar tab, and then buy money orders to pay for his rent and his landline phone. And then he took most of his meals at the neighborhood bar. So that he moved through a world that doesn't exist, but it exists for him. <laughs> and there's a small community of people that he interacts with, and it exists for them too. Well, 
one of the things I, and it, it touches on one of your other uh, stories, indigenous, which is sort of um, a little bit like what it's what it's like to be a local or native when when uh, gentrification comes into to a neighborhood, and it made me think about New York has something um, unique in that you're getting it, you're, you're kind of getting it from both directions in the sense of you have immigrants coming here from all over the world, right? So then and, and you know in ways that change over time, the Irish, the Italians, um, the you know the Germans, the Chinese, whatever it may be, but then on the other hand, you're also getting from the rest of the country people coming here who <laughs> like to make their lives because everyone wants to be in New York. And, and and there's a great line in um, I think it's in Colin McCann's book, The Great World Spin, that is like people, you're a New Yorker once you get off the plane at JFK, right? So everyone who lives in New York mm -hmm. thinks they're a New Yorker, but then there are these people who who like you and I who who were born and raised here. And you look around, and you you know, as he said, as your protagonist says at the end of that story, you know, they're asking where he's from. I'm from here, from here. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, my 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 take on being a New Yorker is like Keith Richards' take on the Rolling Stones. Um, you know, Ronnie Wood got there in 1975, so he's the new guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, yeah, it, it's um, that that is an interesting a way to consider it, as you said, between the immigrant groups and the groups coming from the rest of the country. And all of that skews depending on the economy and um, crime and what, what the city is going through. And obviously we saw in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, when everybody was running out of New York, the good news was it was a place for very creative people to find housing and show up here and start all kinds of fun new movements um, in music and in art and in filmmaking. Uh, that's much tougher now. That I, I wonder about um, young creative people moving here. Uh, it, it, it's not a place you can run to to live inexpensively any longer. No. So that, that's a super tough hurdle. Instead of living in a loft downtown Manhattan, you're living eight, 80 years together in a basement in Bushwick. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, and, and um, I mean, I, I, do, I do find there's a strange nostalgia for the good old days being the bad old days, and, and people forget, you know, True. what it was like. <laughs> and, well, look, I was on the subway today, and I, and I said to my daughter, like, you got to look around. you gotta, you got to be paying attention. Um, you can't just be, like, chatting to, to me or reading. You have to look around. And she sort of, having grown up in a New York that was not at all like that, she was just thinking I was like, what are you talking about? You have sure. I, said, well, sure. I don't know, but there's a guy over there trying to smoke something. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a cigarette. I don't think it's pot. So I don't know what it is, but we're moving to the next call. Um, I want to I talk a little bit about your, your, your stories, because for those of you who don't know, the book is sort of divided roughly in half between um, you know, stories, short stories, and, and essays. And I think there's, a, there's like a sort of a tonal shift from the stories to the essays. But the story you just read, um, it struck me as I was reading reading through them again. Not only, they're ghost stories, but but many of your protagonists, and I he hesitate to call them that, are more like ghouls. <laughs> <laughs> they're sort of they're sort of half alive, and I, and I, I yeah. wondered whether you could talk about how you how do you pick how to frame a story that like who the perspective that you that you choose in creating the because most of your stories are in first person, not all, yeah. and how do you choose what perspective to write write the story from? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you that the, the fiction I've been working on a novel, a second novel, for a long time, a very long time. And even my first novel was not as dark as the short stories get. And I think it took me a while to realize that I don't want to write I don't want to inhabit those spaces for the period of time I would need to, to write a novel. So you can go dark on the short stories because you're only there for a month or so. But, you know, I wouldn't want to, to live there for a couple of years to write a, a book-length manuscript that explores that same territory. But yeah, they're, um, they're certainly lost souls. And that's... I didn't even realize that until I'd written a few of them. 
And the disturbing part is that they're almost all based on real people. Uh, <laughs> and they're, fortunately, the good news is they're based on several real people that you put together into one story. You know, you have the, the story that I just read is about an opioid addicted cop who is using the police scanner to listen in on his neighbor's telephone conversations while he's also looting the medicine cabinet of the people who he's cat sitting for. So I knew somebody who had been injured, a police officer who was injured on the job and subsequently developed a dependence on opioids. I knew somebody else who told me that he was, you know, cat sitting for somebody and he discovered that he could listen in on the, on the conversations. So, and then there was a third person. So I wound up taking those three people and they, they became a short story. Um, fortunately, I don't know any one person who's quite that screwed up. Uh, I hope. Uh, well, another thing I, I've noticed about your, your narrators, um, and it, uh, it struck a chord with me because some, after my first novel came out, someone asked me, well, like, how do you write about working class people? And I said, well, the first thing you start with is work. What do they do for work? Um, and, and, and I think in almost all your stories, there, there, like, there is a discussion of the person's job. Right. What, and I'm, yes. Yeah. So talk a little bit about like how 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 people's job informs their their worldview, their perspective, and how you write that into the into the story. Well, I think that almost everyone's career choices ultimately will start defining how they look at the world if they're any place long enough, and I think that's particularly true of first responders police officers, firefighters, and the fact that people in those professions need to lean on each other and have ultimate confidence in each other. And it becomes, moving back into the ghost story thing, uh, a closed community. Yeah. And people moving through their own world where they don't really step outside of that world very much. So they're, they're defined by their career choice. And they may not be when they start, uh, but I, I met a number of people in police officers, correction officers, court officers that started the job and explained to me they were only going to be here three or four years. They were going to go to law school. Um, they were going to finish college. They were, this is just a transitional step. And when I retired, they were still there. So it, it, it becomes a way that, that you do look at the world and um, as I say in one of the, I think the last essay, Pimps and Hoes, um, you know, you become, if, you, if you're in a criminal justice system or law enforcement, you become attuned to the different parts of the city and you know all of the crime statistics. And you know where it's spiking this week or this month. And when people are talking to you at a cocktail party and tell you where they live, you want to warn them. <laughs> and then you say, yeah, that's insane. All right, let me not do that. Um, yeah. So I, wa I want to go to the essays in a minute, but I do want to ask you mm -hmm. one more question about um, the, the first story, which is When All This Was Bay Ridge, um, which appeared first in Brooklyn Noir, and this is just a brilliant short story, and, and I always, I think it's, I, I get a personal kick out of it, because my father was from Bay Ridge, and he had very clear geographic boundaries <laughs> for what Bay Ridge constituted, mm -hmm. which was not as extensive as the, cat, the, 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 the father in that. but. Um, there's also a bit in there where you were saying, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't remember exactly how you put it, but like the Irish were Irish, but the Norwegian, the Irish were the most Irish, the Norwegian were also Irish, the Puerto Ricans were also <laughs> Irish, you know, were also Irish. And in this sense, and it's, uh, it's something that I think people from outside New York don't quite understand of the, these ethnic enclaves that, are, that have largely disappeared, but people still refer to it and how that informs you know, like, like uh, again, their worldview, their perspective. Sure. Um, there's a place, well, you remember the old Danish Athletic Club, yeah. which see, after, after this book was um, going to press, unfortunately, the Danish Club finally folded after, I think, 120 years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Swedish Football Club, which is not. right down the block. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Swedish Football Club is now, uh, the last time I was in there, it's, uh, it runs, you know, I'm blowing up their spot now, but it runs
gone slightly under the radar. And the last time I was in there, the bartender is uh, Mohawk Indian, and most of the clientele were Puerto Rican and Dominican bikers. And the vibe of the entire place is Scandinavian. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm talking about atmosphere. I'm talking about the crowd. The crowd that are in there are talking about Scandinavian events. They're arguing about sports. But they have become completely indoctrinated into this building that's been running as the Swedish football club for 82 years. So they're members of this tribe. They're part of this community. And that does happen, I think, in, in New York, um, in the ethnic neighborhoods, which are disappearing, certainly, uh, more, than, more than any place else that I've seen. Yeah, I, it's um, when, my, when my wife and I first started dating, I, you know, I, we, we, I took her to Italian places, and I was talking about you know, the Gabagool and, and all this stuff. And she, she was just looking at my name. She was <laughs> Joyce, she was looking at me. And she said, like, are you? I just got to add, are you Italian? I said, yeah. Italian by borough. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to. I want to. I want to leave some time for people to ask questions, but I, I want to talk about the essays because mm -hmm. the essays uh, I had never read. Uh, I've read your fiction before. I'd never read the essays, and they're just very different um, in tone. They're they're um, there's a there's a warmth to them um, that was that's not that that I, I was. I mean, they're, they're they're I wouldn't say they're they're like happy-go-lucky essays, but there's a warmth to them about New York City, and, and the other word that kept coming to me as I read them was systems, right? Each of them in some ways describes a system, um, and I, like, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, in your job, or pick, pick one of the essays and describe the sort of the systems that exist, and when people try to change it, it just inevitably <laughs> does not, it doesn't work well. Well, um... Okay, I think the, the one that lends itself to that would probably be the uh, essay about the Transit Authority. Working in the Transit Authority, which I did for several months back in the early 1980s, and it was also my father's career and two of my uncles. So as I say in the essay, we kind of grew up feeling like the Transit Authority was the company and we were living in the company town. Because... You know, if you were male in my family and you couldn't get a job as a New York City police detective, you went to the Transit Authority. <laughs> so what, what I learned in the months that I worked as, I, I worked as a night watchman uh, just as I was waiting to get called to be a court officer. And, but since my father and my family had worked in the system, I grew up around the train yards. So as a little kid, my father would bring me to the Coney Island yards in the summertime when I wasn't in school and I would play, you know, out there in the yards and I would watch all the old timers putting the tomato plants between the tracks and they were gardening and they, again, these insular communities that would spring up. And one of the things I discovered when I started working as a night watchman was the number of people that lived in the train yards, the employees that didn't have apartments or houses. They simply lived there. They bathed there, they changed their clothes there, they did laundry there, they cooked food, wow. sometimes on stoves that were smuggled in, sometimes just on the hot pipes. Mm -hmm. They would heat or cook food. So, um, again, it's a closed system. When I was up at uh, 207th Street in Inwood in Manhattan, at lunchtime one day I saw these four giant, you know, mountain men looking guys, and they had huge hunting bows and they put them over their shoulders and they walked out and walked across Broadway into a big sanitation department warehouse and there was the enormous piles of salt that they stored waiting for winter to go spread them and they would put targets on the salt and spend their lunch hour firing <laughs> arrows and then put these things back on their shoulders and walk across Broadway and 207th Street. These guys live in their own world. <laughs> and the, the good news is, as crazy and annoying as management can get, they often leave those people alone because they make the system run. Mm -hmm. And I know, I've, I've been there when people ordered uh, subway cars at one point in the early 80s from Japan, 
and it was an interesting experiment and they were trying something new and it kind of worked out but when they started breaking nobody had the tools to fix them and they had to go into um, the old blacksmith shop and there were only two left in New York City and people had to make tools they had to forge the tools to fix these parts and when that happens management is generally smart enough to say if you keep the trains running and they show up on time we'll overlook a great deal of eccentricity <laughs> uh, and they certainly did during my tenure there I, I also thought of systems in the in the final essay, uh, which uh, which is pimps and hoes, which is about you know your time. Sen sensitively titled. Sensitive. <laughs> well, I, I mean, and it's about your time, um, sort of in the courts. And the the anecdote that I loved was, or, or I, I shouldn't say I loved, I, I just found it fascinating was there was a um, there was like a system for prostitutes would come in, they would get a fine. That's the, the, the prosecutor would agree to it. The defense attorney was fine with it. The pimps were usually waiting in the uh, in the galley to, to, to pay. pay. Yeah. And and then one day, a new a new sheriff is in town. A new judge comes in and decides that like this is not working. This woman has been arrested sixteen times. I'm putting her in. Right. And then like that 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 does everyone. The prosecutor, the defense attorney, yeah. everyone like this isn't going to work. But, you know. That, yeah. That. <laughs> Uh, that was a brand new judge with her first day on the bench. And I could see that she was appalled that this was the way the, the prostitution cases were being processed because it would usually be a sweep and it would be, back in the bad old days, it was downtown here. It was usually around 3rd Avenue and uh, Pacific Street or it was Coney Island. Those were the two spots where the big sweeps would, would occur. And you'd be bringing maybe 25 or 30 defendants through, and everybody would get fined. And I mean, I remember the, the first time that I realized it was happening, I spoke to one of the DAs afterwards, and I said, these are prostitutes, and you're fining them. Do you think they're going out and getting a job as an office temp to pay those fines? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and they were just working. And, and he said, well, you know, you pick your spots. We can't fight every case because it would clog up the system. And I said, so we're pimps, you know. We're letting these, these women out to work the streets as long as they pay the freight. You know, they have to come through and, and kick up the freight the same way as one of the arrested gamblers. I thought it was insane that we arrested people for illegal gambling and then fined them. <laughs> um, we're just telling them to work that much harder. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this, this judge came through with the first day on the bench, and as you say, a new, new sheriff in town, she said, nope, we're not doing that. Everybody gets three days. You know, not, not going to kill anybody, but three days will change everything. And the next morning, there was a different judge in the courtroom. <laughs> Judges usually rotated through a week at a time. She did one day, and she never came back. <laughs> so somebody somewhere didn't like this, the uh, apple cart being overturned. Yeah, and, and, and that last essay is, is haunting um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and and I, I, I told you this last week when we, when we met up. Um, about so my father used to used to, we would drive together underneath the BQE and in the pet in like the last 20 years he would uh, he would be driving in the BQE and we'd be looking around and he'd say well, how do all the hunkers yeah. where do all the hunkers go and I'd say you know that you're a little inordinately concerned about <laughs> these women that I'm that I'm assuming you whose services you did not employ but anyway so and, so and I said to him at one point they went inside that and it, it and, and you talk about that uh, in the essay, and, and one of the things that strikes me too, I've been thinking about so many of the vices of the 70s and 80s and 90s have been accepted. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, can't, you walk outside right now, you will smell someone smoking marijuana, right? And, and, and no, they're not, no one's being prosecuted, and, and it's sort of like, well, pot's the new wonder drug, right? And gambling, I mean, New York State, Hey, we, we, we can make a few million dollars in, ta sure. in tax revenue, so it's legal. And the one that has not, but has, has arguably gotten much tougher to prosecute because it's, it, because it's gone underground, is prostitution. Um, and your point is like, even though we don't see it, we're part of the problem. Yeah, and, and to, to my, from my perspective, it's gotten worse. 
I don't know that the numbers have gotten worse, but the conditions have gotten worse, and that is heartbreaking because, again, when I was a teenager, it was taxi driver era New York City. So hookers looked like hookers. You know, it was flashy. It was Times Square-ish. It was flamboyant. It had an air that did not lend itself to, at least as a teenage boy, to seeming to be desperate and dangerous. But by the time I had become a court officer in the early 1980s and crack had arrived, now you were actually seeing women that were adult, that were clearly visibly adult with addiction. And that became kind of grim. And then, you know, Giuliani was elected mayor, and there was this enormous crackdown on vice and on quality of life crimes. And as I mentioned in the essays, you know, squeegee guys are not cleaning car windows in their living rooms. You know, beggars are not shaking a can in their kitchen. But prostitutes are still working. They're just not standing on the corner anymore. And unfortunately, what that has done is it has changed the dynamic from either people that made poor choices or were addicted to now they're prisoners. You know, now, now they're um, just being trafficked. And uh, when they would come toward the end of my career, they very rarely spoke English. They were mostly Russian or Asian. They would keep their eyes down, and they were very small, neatly dressed men. Not the flamboyant pimps of my early days in the system, but neatly dressed men would come up one at a time and pay the fines, and then everybody would leave together. And it had gotten really grim. And, you know, there, it, again, it would be unfair not to acknowledge that there's been progress. There are diversion courts. There are some judges that are uh, effecting change, but it's pretty small against a very vast landscape. Well, I want to, uh, we have a crowd here. I want to open it up for questions. To like the I crowd. said, 850, 900 people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know what people go for. So, uh, why don't you want to start us off? Hi. Yes, sir. Hi, Jim. <laughs> hey, Henry. Um, pimps and hoes, towards the end, you say that the city's gotten a lot meaner where women are concerned. And I wanted to ask you when you saw the change and what you mean by that. Well, I, I sort of the, the very last thing I just said when I uh, when I noticed the change was when I think it's I think it's easier to be to treat people in a mean and cruel fashion when it's not done in public view. So I think you know I'm, I'm probably expressing that kind of poorly, but I think when when vice was more visible. There might have actually been more rules to it. And the fact that um, most of the women in New York City, I believe, who are um, engaging in prostitution are, are you know, essentially being held in slavery. And so I think it's certainly easier for them to be mistreated than it would be if they were more visible. Hi. Hi. Yes. But just following up on that. Um, Currently, prostitutes are sort of referred to as sex workers. And there's a movement to decriminalize and to make it a legitimate way of, of working and making money, somehow involving health care. I don't know how that would work. But um, so I'm surprised. So, so you think that it's, they're not sex workers, they are old school prostitutes that are really being taken advantage of and almost trafficked? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, sure, there are sex workers, and there are, there are you know, high-end call girls, and there are people that are in business, and they are sex workers. And my personal opinion is it should be legal, and it should be um, taxed, and it should be monitored, and there should be, you know, health checks and also health insurance. And I, I certainly believe all that. But that's not the people I'm talking about. That's not the people that I saw. Um, the people that I saw were, you know, running 10 and 12 girls out of a basement in Bensonhurst where you put up plywood petitions and um, it, it's a different world. And they, they're people that were brought over here on the promise of jobs and then when they got here their passports were being held by the pimps and they're forcing them to work it off which they tell them will take a year and 
and it just takes forever. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I love your writing. Uh, there's like a... Thanks, I got a small bill I just yeah. tucked in that book for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's always like a musicality to your prose. Can you talk a little bit about how like your affinity for punk and no wave and sort of the early 70s mm-hmm. movement has affected you as an artist? Oh, big time. No, but I loved hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yet, you know, growing up again in the years when I was a teenager, which is just sort of when both punk and hip hop were starting, were really jumping off. And I was very fortunate in that I went to high school on 16th Street in Manhattan. So I was right down the block from CBGB's. So as we would hear about these different bands, we were able to go down there and, and see all the stuff as it was jumping off. And again, even though I was you know, a pretty dumb kid, there was a part of me that knew that something very special was happening here. That this was not just we're seeing a new band this week, that there's something's happening to the music here that isn't happening elsewhere, or at least I thought it was, wasn't happening elsewhere. <laughs> um, and, and how does that affect uh, the way I write? I, I, still, I still look for those feelings of magic in going to different places and uh, tr- trying to pick up that vibe of when the city used to sort of hum like that. It's funny because I also feel like you have, like, and this is probably a reflection of my own background, but there's a Catholic sensibility in a lot of your, your writing. And, you know, that there's a great line in, in um, one of your essays where you say this is the, uh, the, the Irish Holy Trinity of jobs. Jobs, and, benefits, and, pension. Jobs, benefits, <laughs> yeah, and pension. But, uh, I, but uh, it's interesting that people see, they see another influence as well. Um, yeah. one, of, one of the things my father would always say when he would say it's so long to somebody, we'll see you around the parish. <laughs> it was how you defined where you live. Yeah, well, it's, and, and that is actually, that was true. So growing up on Staten Island, it was all, sure. are you all HC or LSS? Right. Are you all LP or all <laughs> QP? So um, I think that's still, and we've talked about this, Staten Island has become the South Brooklyn of 30 years ago. Oh, definitely. Um, Absolutely. It's just, yeah. it's just migrated over the okay. bridge. More questions. Yeah, um, so you said yourself, and I've read a couple of them, that the stories can be pretty dark, um, even just very on the subject matter. Um, but what I liked about it, there's so much humor sprinkled within, no matter what. And now hearing you say that, you know, immersing yourself into those stories was hard for you, I'm wondering how much of the humor that you put in was for your own benefit. Oh, good question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Thanks, because, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I thought about it. I think it's just sort of perhaps a natural reaction trying to lighten up a moment in there. Um, I know that when we did the audio book, um, I was very fortunate that uh, they asked me to read it. So uh, it was probably my British accent. <laughs> and I, so I was working, we were recorded at home and they sent all this equipment and stuff and we had to hang quilts up and you know, get this quasi-soundproof kind of thing, and they, they, we had a live director and an engineer. <clears throat> and after we finished the fourth story, I'm not really noticing anything, and finally the director was like, damn, Tim, <laughs> does this stuff ever lighten up? <laughs> really? <laughs> because I didn't sit down and write those four stories. Those four stories were written probably over eight years. So the, the weight of, of of reading four dark stories didn't really hit me until I sat down and I went through it one at a time. Uh, but yeah, I would say that's why the humor is there. Sure. Hey. I have a, like a comment. Tim, I love your wit. You're incredible and I love your stories and I could listen to them forever. I only have so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember um, when, because we're neighbors, I was going through a nasty divorce and I would pass you sometimes on the way to the courthouse and talking about systems, I remember you saying, oh God, like stay away from matrimonial, you know, like you said the gamblers, they went in, paid their fines and left. And it was like, we were the amateurs, you know? Well, that's, yeah, (laughs) 
I did my entire career in criminal, uh, either criminal court or Supreme Court criminal term. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very fortunate because I only dealt with professionals. <laughs> uh, you get to matrimonial court, those people hate each other. <laughs> uh, you know, if, if you are doing security work, you will work for a living in those places. <laughs> you know, give me a bank robber any day. <laughs> questions. Anyone? Alright, I have, a, I have a few more. I want to talk about being an older boy. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I, I was also an older, older boy, um, but like you as well. Um, uh, lucky enough to not be a plaintiff the, uh, these days. Yeah. Because there were, there, there were yeah. a fair few of them. Uh, yeah. But also, and that was a question about the parish, there was um, there was this urban legend in there, or not even urban legend, the story about how the the, the, the jewels were returned. Mm. And I love how there, that is just something that is just, as, as we'd say, like known. It's yeah. just it's just known. Oh, no one yeah. knows how it's known, but it's known. And I thought that might be maybe it'll be a nice way for to end. Explain, tell that story about sure. how, how how the jewels were returned. <clears throat> well, the uh, the church that I attended and where I was an altar boy is called Regina Pontius. And it is on 65th Street between 12th and 13th Avenue. So it sort of straddles um, Bay Ridge, Bensonhurst, Borough Park. It's, it's kind of at a, a nexus of, of three different communities. And when I was growing up, it was um, entirely Italian and me. <laughs> um, it, now it is actually mostly Asian, um, Probably secondarily Italian, and a splat, spattering of scattering of Middle Eastern people, and just yeah. And now it's kind of a little bit more mixed, but it was again really closed when I was growing up there. And there had been behind the altar these incredible uh, diamond um, sort of crowns that went behind um, the infant uh, Jesus and Mary, and they were stolen. In 1950 or 51, right after, shortly after the church was opened, and within two weeks they were returned. And about a week after they were returned, the body of a jewel thief um, turned up in Bath Beach, about a mile away from the church. And now I was born in 1958, so this happens seven years before I'm born. But by the time I'm six years old, I know that story. <laughs> Everybody in the neighborhood knows that story. Everybody knows the name of the guy that turned up dead. His name was Ralph Emino. Emino, I think. And, but, um, as, as you say, Eddie, growing up, I believed it, but I also wasn't sure, you know, to what extent is it urban legend? Right. And I didn't get... I didn't verify that it happened until I was sitting down to write the essay. And that was when I went online and I actually found the clippings from the New York newspapers, including the big clipping about the mysterious return of the jewels and uh, then the subsequent death of the jewel thief. So it's, again, foundations of a closed society. When those jewels were stolen, um, one of the... Um, one of the, the patrons of the church was one of the mob bosses, Profaci. And word went out that those jewels could not be fenced anywhere and that they simply needed to be returned. And they were. And it was, again, you know, the society that you moved through as a little kid. And as I also mentioned, that was when I first learned about being an altar boy. You got tips at weddings and funerals. <laughs> I was getting 70 cents a week allowance, and I'm working a wedding, and someone's slipping me $5. And the older altar boy is saying, you know, keep your fucking mouth shut, put it in your pocket. And you start to learn at an early age, wow, wait, really cool. I can, still, I can still act really happy every Monday when I get my 70 cents. Thanks, Dad. I'm going to the movies this afternoon. I might get some pizza. Um, you know, you learn about money laundering. How it, you know, money just gets, gets, you know, washed. Well, I'm, I'm, rem I'm reminded of my uh, my parish priest, Father Burke, who was off the boat in Ireland, and. Um, Later turned out was raising gun money for the IRA. Oh. And, uh, he was he was the best priest to confess to because um, 
you were like in the seventh grade and there were you know certain things you weren't weren't sure how to confess father Bert, as you try father Bert would just sort of lean over and through the confessional would say impure thoughts covers a lot of ground Thank you for writing it. You should all buy it. There's something in there for everyone. The stories, if you're into noir, the short stories are amazing. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you're like an old time New Yorker, you love those like sort of 70s and 80s movies, the essays pick up some of that and the writing is just good all the way through. So thank you for writing this. Thank you for, uh, for, for launching your book here. Question. Thank you. Well, one, one, one more question. Uh, anything to get the attention. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, great stories. Uh, I was there for a few of them. <laughs> all all and, the charges have been dropped. <laughs> and I know there are a lot more. Are uh, you working on volume two? Um, I'm working on more stories. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, you know, I would say volume two, geez, can only be around the corner a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> At the rate that I put out, you know, produce work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again. Let's give Tim another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. Books for sale uh, around the corner. Tim will be signing as well. Um, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you. 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 Thank you.